everybody and welcome back to another episode of Against All Odds and as I say at the beginning of every podcast it's purely selfish reasons because I get to interview the most inspiring people and today we've got the amazing Emma Woodford from Like Life Coaching with Emma Woodford. How are you my lovely? I'm really good thank you Amy, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. We were just discussing before we press record the joys of working from home and these screens that are hiding oh my god partially hiding <laughs> but it's fine because we work from home and this is the reality of it, it so, we reality. Just... <laughs> so my lovely I always say to people that you, you are an inspiration to me and obviously you do a lot of life coaching for ladies that are kind of going through a relationship where they're half suffering mentally mm-hmm. Um, which is in my eyes amazing because men's mental health is sky high isn't it it's it's very difficult but how I always ask people there's always a big why Mm. they've decided to go out and impact people the way you do so what is your big why where did it start my big why is like a lot of people it's a personal story so a a number of years ago now probably like eight years ago um I started on a journey with my own kind of like development and things and I'd started reading about self-development and actually it was started off with like leadership books I wanted to be a better leader in work and then we had a few things which happened in our personal life um and my husband's mental health started taking um some wobbles and unfortunately we got to a point where it was no longer wobbles they were it was quite a a big impact on his mental health and that went on for a number of years and it didn't obviously it was really hard for my husband and but it was also hard for me and I felt like I didn't have anybody to talk to I didn't know where to go to to get support or help um, I looked for support and tried to reach out for support and there just wasn't anything out there Amy and what there was was pretty awful like even now if you go on the mind website and which I think mine's an absolutely like fantastic resource for people look, looking to understand more about mental health but if you click on there they've got a, a network for supporters or oh, and it's just people offloading how how bad things are and there's no outlet there's nothing to support one another it's just this kind of spiral of how things are are not great and I wanted to change that I think that it is really tough and it's not talked about and mental health still isn't talked about as much as it it needs to be and should be I think men's mental health is having there where the conversations are starting to happen more and more which is fantastic and still more needs to be done but then the conversations with how is that affecting other people just isn't there because we're so far behind with the mental health conversations that it isn't thought about and it's I think there's a lot of guilt and shame around it as well of feeling like I can't you know the other person's a person who has mental illness or poor mental health at a time and I shouldn't be feeling like this it's not me if they get better it'll it'll be fine and I think there's a lot of guilt and shame and not wanting to put a burden on the other person which means everything then gets covered up and like you don't want to talk to people you don't want people to think you're a bad person for feeling that you're also finding it hard and so it all gets buried and that's not healthy and then it imp- impacts you at the no, end of the day. it's not it's... yeah and then you yeah yeah poorly and it's it yeah I mean it's one of those things where it's it's hard to see a loved one whether they're suffering mentally or physically and I think us ladies seem to go into fixing mode when in reality we can't fix. But it seems to be a woman thing, doesn't it? That we we jump into this rescue mode of, I don't know what, it, I don't know what it is thinking that, and then blaming ourselves when they don't feel any better. Yeah, I think men do try and rescue as well. I think they do it in a different way. 
but I think we is there's definitely a female habit of putting the emphasis on us and blaming ourselves when like if they aren't going to the doctor for whatever reason then that's us not being a good enough wife or good enough partner to be able to support them to go to the doctors or we do put an awful lot of emphasis on ourselves and in reality a lot of it is nothing to do with us whatsoever and and it's a harsh truth but we can't fix them we can't make them get better we can't like force them to go to the doctors we can't we can't control that so we need to focus on what we can control and actually when we focus on what we control and our input and how we are it can have a huge impact on them yeah absolutely so did you get to a point where it was like really starting to affect you because it's not the easiest thing is it to deal with somebody that's depressed in such a small vicinity as well as home yeah like how did you mentally cope with that so I didn't at first at all that went through a number of years where I was um didn't want to come home so I was working working and was working late and was dreading coming home for fear of like what I was walking into um and or the like I'd be sat at downstairs by myself for hours like and I wouldn't speak to anybody else I'd speak to people at work but then come home and not have a, a normal conversation and that wasn't great so it did it started to impact me as well and I just I got to a point where I realized that I needed to take control for me of what I could do and I had a bit of a like life review and I was like actually I'm not doing anything for myself so I didn't have any activities that I was just doing for me by myself had a lot of things which I was doing with my husband a lot involved drink actually as well which wasn't necessarily helpful right. for either okay. of us um and just started like picking away at things and did a lot of reading and started using methods like one of the methods which I train out now is around it's a com combination of Brene Brown's shitty first drafts and what I know now is Katie Byron type of work where and I suppose it's effectively like journaling so writing down everything that was going on in my head and picking out is this true do I really know this is true do I need to find out whether this is true or not because I used to make up a lot of stories Amy about so mm -hmm. I don't like a lot of stories about making it my fault of if um um if something had happened and I would make it my fault that so if my husband's mood deteriorated and he took himself to bed I would look for what I, I had done to make that happen and in reality I had it wasn't all on me I I hold my hands up there are things that I may have done that may have contributed to that because when all of us are like living humans and we all do things which irritate one another yeah. but often it's that little straw yeah. that <laughs> broke the camel's back isn't it and it's sometimes easier yeah, yeah. To, if you <clears throat> be struggling all day at work and then you come home it's easier to just be like let go at home and often therefore the people at home take a lot of brunt for what's going on yeah so yeah yeah absolutely did you feel any kind of resentment because I, I, I speak to a lot of people that say when they've dealt with something like that you do go through like this period of resentment towards that person because you just want them to be all right that much that you actually start resenting them a little bit and it's quite hard to admit isn't it mm. 100% wanted them to to get better 100% wanted them to be able to to see that they were where they were getting to and I think that was another hard bit for me Amy was so I trained as a mental health first aider and I think one of the the lowest points for us which was a day where I ended up having to phone the police because I, James my husband had left the house and I didn't know where he'd gone um and he'd it actually transpired that he'd taken himself to accident emergency 
but that was an awful day for me like well for both of us not just for me that was an absolutely awful day and actually I think one of the the best days for us as well because it was definitely that low point that meant that everything got started to really get a lot lot better from that point so did I resent it I think there was definitely points where I thought I don't know how I can carry on with this like I remember yeah. going out in the to my car driving around the corner and phoning my friend and just absolutely sobbing and being like I don't know I don't know how to carry on like this is I don't know how to I feel like shit he obviously feels like shit I don't know how to support him anymore I don't know what to do I don't know that I felt resentment but I did, did definitely feel a lot of guilt around all of those feelings as well and I rarely spoke yeah. about to even that day when I was speaking to my best friend it still felt like really hard to talk in those feelings out yeah I felt like I was being <clears throat> a bit of a bitch really yeah and and you know what that's that's quite common so like with you what with the work you do and I speak to a lot of carers of course like with dementia mm. like we all have these feelings but we find it hard to actually come out and say because it's like well it's those that are suffering really we should be thinking of them and these feelings and they just feel wrong for having them yeah. So you kind of bottle it up a little bit, don't you? Instead yeah. of going, actually, I'm not dealing with this very well. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. And I just feel completely out, out of my depth. Yeah. Which which is really, like I say, it's really common to the amount of people I speak to. And, and everybody, every single person will admit how hard it is to actually come out and say that. I think they only admit that often when they're coming out of it or they've got somebody who they know has been through that because then yeah. they know that it's more likely that they actually can relate and I think that's why so you're when you're talking to people around dementia and things if they know that you've had experience of that or you're in a certain environment where it's quite common then people will talk about it but there aren't necessarily like groups for those supporting loved ones with poor mental health there just aren't those networks which I think they're starting to be possibly with for dementia care and things with there's like groups and things for it but it is really hard it's really really hard to come out and say those things because you have to feel supported yeah again. another thing yeah and another thing as well and I do think well I know men and women struggle with this but you know when we 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 get into learn about we have to put ourselves first like we do have to put ourselves first and you know we all it almost makes people feel guilty and feel like they're being selfish to start putting themselves first yeah um I mean we, we don't kind of live in a society that kind of pushes that very much so and you were saying that you started to do little things for yourself when you started doing that did you feel guilty at first for for doing it a little bit odd a little bit odd I definitely resonate with the I think as a society we we absolutely think that it's being selfish taking time to look after ourselves and something I say all of the time is that it isn't selfish it's absolutely essential because and I know that they're the cliches but you absolutely can't support somebody else to the best of your ability and it makes you poorly if you're not taking time to look after yourself and it is hard and it does feel odd and I used to worry about taking that time because I'd be like well I should be spending my time that time with my husband but over time you I, I noticed a difference in me and noticed that it did really help me having it was only an hour it was an hour to go dancing once a week um and not only was it something that I really enjoyed doing so I think that's really key as well having something that finding stuff that you love doing that lights you up but the time away time out of the house time to talk about something different that wasn't work and wasn't well life I suppose <laughs> Yeah, oh, I love that dancing. And you already got that. Did you just come up with that? Yeah, yeah, I love that. You're still doing it. I still do it now. Yeah, <laughs> every Tuesday I go dancing. Oh, well, I that's used amazing. To, yeah, I used to do it when I was little, 
and and I was like oh that would be a good thing to do if there's somewhere close by and it's just in our village which is really amazing as well so really lucky so, yeah. that's it and then like you're getting out and you're meeting other people as well and your kind of world's getting a little bit bigger yeah because more often than not when when you are struggling with somebody's mental health it's all of a sudden your world gets so small so small you start cancelling plans either together or individually I know that I used to um like put off making plans with friends and things because I would think that I wanted to be around in case something happened um for maybe a fear of what I might come back to um yeah and your world absolutely just gets smaller and smaller and and you know this Amy as well when that happens as well I think you said it on one of your podcasts recently or something that I've watched you doing about being the sum of the five people that you spend the most amount of time with and that energy and everything and if you're closing that down into into people who are not necessarily well or and I just I say just work people but people who you are associating with through necessity rather than because they light you up or you enjoy spending time with people um I enjoy spending time with some of my work people (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> just <to> go. <laughs> you've got to get out that in there quick <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah you, I love you that well <laughs> <laughs> it, do, it does as well and uh, did you ever get to the point you know when you like talking to people like that you didn't want to be talking about your struggles because we start to worry that we become the bore so that's quite difficult as well, isn't it? If I'm honest, Amy, I didn't like there was only a couple of people who I really talked to about how I was. And that wasn't that frequently either. And I did just bottle it up, which isn't healthy and wasn't helpful. And it was only when I started opening up that um, like to a, still probably only a select few people because it was people that I knew I could trust and weren't going to. I feel, feel like it weren't going to judge me um and so in that respect the people that I was opening up to I didn't really feel like I was going to become the bore because I knew that I felt really safe with them um even if they mm. didn't have the experiences that to relate to I just felt safe with them and was able to to talk to them about it yeah but I know that that's, that's really good it's good it's- yeah, yeah, I, I think it's really important that even if you've just got one person that's close, like that, it's it's like worth its weight in gold, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, and it's easy you know, to push away. Uh, we, we are. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's it's one of that. It is. It's a society thing, isn't it? It's stiff upper lip. Um, you know, we don't talk about these things, and it's so so damaging. Mm. So what other things did you, apart from dancing, that did you start to do? So I used to like journal and pick out the stories that I was running in my head, as I said. I think that was that was really, really massive for me because it started to allow me to identify patterns and to recognise for myself that some of these stuff that I was telling myself wasn't true and it wasn't about me and it wasn't my fault. Um, I used to do things like I started exercising, so I started going running. I spent a lot. I started going for walks in nature, um, which I absolutely love. And now I feel like a real deep connection with nature, which I didn't didn't used to feel, and that has helped me tremendously. Um, latterly, um, things like meditation, I've really really recognised the benefits of, but I wasn't necessarily doing those early on. I wish that I had the practices that I do now at those times or people to talk to me about doing a lot of the things which I do now. Um, so being aware of things that I, that I do enjoy doing, so like cold water dips and swimming, I think tallied in with the fact that it's in nature. I absolutely like just the feeling when I go for a swim or a dip in the lake just and I know there's a lot of science behind it as well about the ions of the water and things but just absolutely adore it it's just it like I remember once we went up to South Shields in the sea and I felt like an absolutely new woman when I go out of the sea just something like magical felt like it happened so cold water 
um meditation and these are things that was, as I say I wasn't necessarily doing these earlier on but anybody that I was working with now there are things that I would recommend doing um journaling so gratitude looking at what I'm really grateful for each day because even in those hard days it's important I feel to to recognize what you've achieved what is the the high points even if they're like small things like I had a really lovely cup of tea or something today or had a bath and the self-care and I think I know that's talked about a lot as well but it's something that we just overlook I think and all those things are self-care like let's not get away from that fact they're all part of self-care and things like just baths like a bubble bath like for half an hour listening to a podcast dancing we've said about my dancing on a class but put in when I notice that my energy is dropping or I want to shift some like feelings where I'm feeling not so great so actually today I felt a bit tired before I did this podcast I'm just putting some like music that I love on some like old school cheesy house music and just dancing around like it's incredible yeah. how much that can shift your energy and transform your your mood and your energy it's incredible do you know what I, I love everything you've just said there because it's all very simple stuff you know it doesn't cost the earth because you know it's we are again we are people where it will it'll be we'll be happy once we've been on holiday or we've been happy this next best thing and I always say to people about brain health anyway like everything that you've said literally is good for your brain like it's so good for your brain chemicals like serotonin and your dopamine and your oxytocin and it's the tiniest tiniest little things that you could just build into a daily routine or, an, or a weekly routine yeah. that will automatically make you feel better uh, but it's it's interesting that like you said about the meditation thing because I mean I meditate now but I tried for quite a few years mate where you know you'd be sat there on a YouTube channel and you've got one that's an hour long and then after about 15 minutes you're thinking about what you've got to go and pick up at Morrison's and and things like that so what kind of meditation do you use and like how how long is each like meditation session because I think people worry about that they're having to spend hours meditating so it varies like sometimes if I um get up early enough sometimes I'll do like a 15 20 minute meditation in the morning sometimes if I know that I've got to be out early like this morning I only no yesterday morning I only did a five minute meditation but then I'll do a longer meditation when I go to bed but still only like 15 20 minutes maximum um yeah. and like I struggled for a very long time with meditation because partly because of my expectations of what was going to happen yes. and everybody's saying and sometimes I worry about saying about meditation because it plays into this like everybody thinks well it's not working for me because everyone says how amazing meditation is and in reality Amy I still have not had very many I think I've had one or two where I've been like oh, bloody hell that wasn't right that was quite different but most of the time it's just time where I just feel still and quiet and I'm not having, I think people do expect these like out of body experiences <laughs> or, and some people I do have that, but I, and even like visualizations and stuff, I don't normally have those either. Um, and I'm, a, you know, I'm happy with that. And I understand that now, whereas for a long time, I struggled with meditation because I had these expectations of what should be happening and what, what wasn't happening and getting in my head about that. Yeah. Do you know what? And I, you, you've hit the nail on the head because I'm the same but I often think you know it's not we go in with these big expectations but I think you've got to look at it and go what do I get from it and for me it's just like 10 minutes of headspace yeah. it's that, that that's what I get from it and if and it's one of those things if I haven't done it for a week I can tell I've not done it yeah exactly yeah, yeah. so it's like 10 minutes of headspace like when when I go to the gym now like I'm literally going with an audio book and it's purely for headspace that is my big why you know so I think if you can tie it into like all headspace so if you think about it like your meditation your cold dips your yeah. swimming even dancing around with music on it's yeah. purely for your own headspace which is amazing yeah 
So you asked me how I do it. So again, it's not, I don't have a the same thing which I do every time. So they vary in time, but sometimes I use Insights Timer. Sometimes I just focus on my breath and spend 10 minutes. I suppose that would probably be fast as breath work, but it's not necessarily breath work as in how some breath work practitioners would teach it. It's just focusing on my breath. Um, sometimes I do it lying down. Sometimes I do it sat up. I don't have a, so whilst I do have a meditation practice, it's not that I'm doing the same thing every time. Um, yeah. It depends on how I'm feeling, what I feel like I need. Sometimes I'll put one on for energy. I love a body scan though. I do, that was again, when I first did a body scan, that was kind of like transformational for me as well. I, I, I love it. Well, so I know other people who don't like focusing on each of the areas of the body, but I, I love that. That's amazing. Do you know what? I've not actually tried one of them, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try one now. You said. Um, so the cold water dips, <clears throat> is they hard to get into? Do you have to fight yourself at first, or is it just one of those things that you just get in and not think about it? So I don't do dips in um like a cold water bath type thing very often we have got one in the garden but I really struggle to do that and I think it's because it's the straight in plunge yeah <laughs> <laughs> I struggle with that um and so I prefer going to the lake or the river well the lake or the river or some sort of body of water or the ocean although in Nottingham there's not very well you're close yeah, yeah, but, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not, not, no. <laughs> um and I think part of that is because you can gradually immerse yourself um which helps regulate my breathing and I just feel more in control and I prefer it that way it's still when I go in the winter it's still a mental battle of why am I getting in this water at the end of it I feel great but the mm -hmm. oh it's so cold <laughs> uh, still is a mental battle and I think that's part of it I think the winning the mental battle is part of it and there was absolutely and like pat yourself on the back for it afterwards yeah it's like a yeah. win for you and do you know what it must be like if you're having a bad time like at home it must be give you little things to look forward to mm. for you to do for yourself yeah absolutely so that might that must be quite empowering as well yeah and it's a bit meditative as well so I've started swimming in open water as well and that is I find that quite meditative because it I think I think again because it's like focus on the breath control in the breath rep repetition of and sequencing of breath but yeah absolutely time for yourself time where you are just focusing in on <laughs> either the cold or you know the feelings the sensation is absolutely the epitome of just being in the present isn't it because you're yes. just being there with how you are feeling and you can't your mind can't <clears> focus <throat> on everything else because you're focusing on controlling your breathing so you don't like go into cold water shock and mm. the sensations it's absolutely epitome of just being in the present do you know what I, i'm glad you said that because i often think you know when you're dealing with mental illness you you've said about you like beating yourself up and thinking it's you so you've gone like past thinking but you also must worry about the future and what's going to happen so it's it's very up and down isn't it yeah and it is again that's it's hard because obviously you do think about the future and we have to accept that that's not it especially if we're thinking about the other person that isn't in our control mm. I'd love to be able to say work with me and I will be able to make you feel better and as a result your partner will get better and you know nobody can make those claims mm. because nobody's got a well a magic wand to be able to fix them fix yeah. them that's not a great terminology but um to make them better yeah and yeah obviously your mind is gonna be thinking about what's gonna be happening in the in the future and I think we there is a a level of you have to accept that 
I can only deal with what I've got in front of me now. What can I control here and now? Yeah, that's amazing because everything that you do, like, like I say, with the ice baths and the meditation and the, and the dancing and sticking the music on, is keeping you right at that present moment. Like you can't, you're not going forward or backwards, which I think is so important when you're looking after somebody. Um, like I say, whether it's mentally or physically, it's, you know, it is a caring role, even though you're married and he's your husband, you all of a sudden became like a carer. Yeah. And it's hard, isn't it? Because carers don't get recognised. If you could have a magic wand and you could speak to the government and mind charities and mental health charities, what would you be saying to them right now to help women in the situation that you've been in? say that similar to what we did I don't know five six years ago with mental health like we need to start the conversation we need to start normalizing that it is hard and it's not to take away from um the individuals that are in poor mental health or mental illness but we need to start that conversation we need to show that it is normal and to create um networks so people can feel like they're not by themselves and to have some access to resources that like you said a lot of those things you know whilst obviously I'd love people to come to me as a coach and I think through coaching you develop a lot more other things as well and we talk about a lot about communication and other tools which support that whole the whole arena of supporting yourself and others but yeah normalizing that it is hard and other people you're not on your own having I suppose a, a telephone line or something a bit like Samaritans or something where people can reach out and talk to even if it's like a an add-on to those support services just that it's recognized and talked about more I say just it's not just at all yeah. that'd be huge <clears throat> yes yeah, it, it would be. I, do, I think it'd be very slow in happening if if they were to start doing that, to be honest. And I do believe if if anybody is listening that is in this kind of situation, I highly recommend that you work with a coach. And the reason for that is that you can develop a much more meaningful relationship with the people that you work with mm. than them ringing at the end of a telephone line yeah absolutely that do you know what I mean I think and that's the key isn't it because like like I've said with everybody like if you can resonate with somebody you've won half the battle like yeah. all of a sudden their defense will drop and they'll just see you as somebody that can help yeah so so if the government want to have me as a coach or any like coaches as absolutely part of that, <laughs> Yeah, let's go for that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's go for that. Yeah, I, I, I do believe, I don't, I just, I can, you know, if you're feeling really shit mentally, like, let's be honest, who's going to pick up a phone to help Brian? Would you have picked up a phone? In reality, no, would I wouldn't you have, have wanted that? to speak to a stranger, to be honest, no. And I completely agree that if you've got somebody that you can work with longer term and a coach who can support you with the different aspects of it, then that would absolutely be the better route to go down. But I don't think the government would. Be put that in place. <laughs> it's more likely yeah. that they put a, a helpline in place. <laughs> you, <laughs> never know. That's, you never know. <laughs> you never know. We can all, we can all hope and dream. Well, I think that's it. I think, you know, when you first realised that actually you weren't feeling okay, like, I applaud you for, like, getting out of your own way because I think that is the hardest step, mm. is holding your hands up and going, right, where where can I go for help? What can I do? So if, you've, if, you, if anybody's listening now that's in that position where they haven't took a step yet, what would you say to them? I would say start by thinking about 
what you can do that you love doing that you can just take some small little steps to look to do something for yourself that makes you feel good so whether it is you know things like taking a bath taking the time like just start reflecting on little things that you could start doing that could make your day a little bit better and taking the time for you and start building on it yeah absolutely so in your so is it like a program that you've got where you work with ladies so tell me a bit more about what's in the program what can they if they want to come and have a look for you online what what are they going to expect in the program so I've got a number of programs I've got a 28 day program where we start like just refocusing on you so we look at what exactly what I've said there so what do you enjoy doing what gives you energy what drains your energy what can we start looking about that there gratitude um sleep like how it what is your sleep um oh what's the word hygiene yeah Uh, you know like what are you doing before you go to sleep how are you preparing for bed starting to introduce things like meditation so those little small things and is that a group program so I can do it either way so the I've got a core bit which is the the program and then you can either have group coaching or one-to-one depending on which which suits you better and both options but I see I think working in a group personally is better if you are feeling unsure about yourself and where everything's going I honestly believe the power of a group is absolutely incredible yeah the group work does seem to work quite well in that again you see that you're not the only person so when people bring stuff to group coaching and somebody's like oh this is I'm like oh that happens to me as well or that's really so the seeing that the the commonality of the things they might they're obviously not going to be exactly the same but bring other people bringing stuff to the coaching sessions can be so powerful that you don't even if you're not feeling great you don't have to put your hand up but you're still likely to take a lot from what others are bringing to the table um yeah, yeah. we've got some i've got some other courses i've got a six-week course which is all around communication um so communication craft where we look at non-violent communication things about um transaction analysis so where you are sitting in I'm okay you're not okay or the um drama triangle of whether you're the persecutor and the victim or the um I can't remember the third one now but where you where you often what I've noticed is people often flip between the persecutor and the victim in the in their react in their transactions with the the person that they're supporting so how to break those habits and to recognize that you're doing it as well because recognition is a huge thing and until you understand that these um things are at play in play for us all that they happen for us it's in your blind spots and therefore just like learning about these things can bring can be really mind-blowing to the transformational to your communications with other people um non-violent communication I talk about that bringing things up about quite often we push our agendas on other people so if I want to have a conversation about something and it's um, important to me at that particular time but it might not be the best time for somebody else to have that conversation so bringing things into play like I would like to have a conversation about X, Y, and Z. When would be a good time to have that conversation? So there's a mutual agreement of when you can have it rather than, well, A, potentially having a conversation when your emotions are flared or their emotions are flared or you coming in and saying, like prepared what you want to say in your head, but giving them no time to think about (laughs) what it is that that you want to talk about, like blindsiding them with this conversation. Um, communication is huge and I think that is a massive massive element of and a big thing that you as the the love the person who's providing support it's has a huge impact on well the other person feeling seen and heard and actually when you start demonstrating the tools and techniques 
that you also start becoming feeling like you've been seen and heard because of the way that you're um bringing the conversations up which is huge yeah do you know what i was about to say communication i bet because i bet that's one of the first things to decline yeah, when there's a problem time. isn't it yeah yeah because you were do you ever get to the point where you're like, I don't say that in case it causes trouble, I don't say this, or you've, you've, like I say, you've had a crap day at work and you've gone in and you're a bit more loud and forward than you would normally. So it's it, that, again, is like a balancing act. Yeah, like you're walking on eggshells, like on the good days you think, oh, I'm not going to bring this up because it might detract from, like, if they're having a good day, then I won't bring it up because... But then on the bad days, well, I can't bring this up because they're already in a bad place. So it's not going to be helpful to have it. Yeah, it's a bit chicken and egg syndrome going on there, isn't it? Which, and also though, Amy, some of that is in, is your perceptions and what's going on in your head and isn't necessarily a reality. reality. Mm. So yeah, checking yourself and how you're showing up uh, a lot. Everything that I do, Amy, is, although it's to support you, supporting your loved ones, it's all about you as an individual. And when you start looking at the things that you can do to support it and the, like, it's just so big and I think you don't realise it. And it's not to, again, it's not about blaming yourself because, but it's just recognising that there are things that I could do differently. Yeah. There are things Absolutely. So once you started like putting all this self-care in place, doing things for you, did that help your husband in any way? Did he kind of take note of that and start doing little things for him? So with our journey, and I say our journey, so we both started working with a coach at the same time. Well, in fact, James had done a 28 day program with Paul. Yeah. Before I did. So I'd become aware of Paul through James Smith previously um and I'm not quite sure how James found Paul originally but then we went to one of his live events and the journey kind of like started from from there so I think we've been really lucky actually that we um well not lucky but it's been really helpful that we both started on a journey together at the same time um but what I have seen with a lot of my clients is that it can work the other way. So when my clients work on themselves and start recognizing these stories, um, that, that a lot of them are creating in their head by themselves, it means that they can let go of the frustration. It means that they show up differently. It means that they relate to other people. They're not snapping. So it does have a massive knock-on effect for not just their loved ones, but everybody else around them too yeah and obviously themselves yeah so there are some people who have been coaching who they have noticed with their loved ones that there has been a a huge change now whether that is in their perception or reality it, i don't know hard to tell yet yeah. <laughs> hard to tell hard to tell yeah but in reality it doesn't really matter if they're no. feeling better about their relationship and like I've had clients say that it's saved their marriage working with me so wow. that feels yeah it feels big and it is impactful I know it's impactful and it yeah. is working on yourself I, could, uh, I said to you before I can't make any claims about being able to help the other person and when I reflect on conversations that I've had with James I also recognize that he's he's said in the past there was nothing that and this is just our relationship but there was nothing that I could have done at the time any differently that would have or that would have like made him do things or there was no conversations that I could have done differently or things that we could have done differently that would have made him do things like differently like go to the doctors earlier or all those things yeah I think that's something that I hear really really frequently as well is 
yeah that we mentioned it earlier but you put a lot of emphasis on yourself to try and fix the other person and actually a big part of it is realizing that you can't control what you do and you know this as well it's about that other person when I talk about the victim mode and the persecutor when people say they're making me feel like this like when I said I didn't want to come home and stuff realizing that that is that's all on me as well that's in my control about how I'm feeling is in my control yeah yeah you're so right you're so right I think it's sometimes it's difficult for people to see that when they're in like a stressful environment um and it is empowering actually when you do realize that that you can do things for you to make you feel better um that's so important and yeah like you say we can't and it's I think it's the message of the podcast really that we can't fix anybody else it doesn't matter what we try um and all we're doing is probably hurting us more by trying because mm. that in itself can of cause frustration on our own part yeah I think all the what you yeah. can do the most is like show up lovingly and caring um and that I think that transpires through everything if you're and if you know deep in your heart that everything that you're doing is through love and with the best intentions you're probably going to get it wrong like we all get things wrong like whether it's our partners our children we don't get everything right do we and we learn from it and we take from it and and move on. I feel so right. <laughs> so how's James doing now? Is he a lot better? Is how's he doing? He's amazing. Yeah, he's doing. Yeah, he's he's amazing. He's been working with um, a coach for a long, for a, a good few number of years now. Um, he has put in place a lot of tools and techniques a lot of which we've talked about today already um meditation Uh journaling exercise um we're both alcohol free now um yeah there's been and he's yeah absolutely smashing it he's training for a Ironman at the moment he's run multiple marathons um like both of our lives were just achieving more than more than we were ever were before it's yeah it's been and that doesn't always have to happen for everybody um you know life can go back to what it it was before and it doesn't have to be a huge big transformation either but yeah James is doing amazing and really proud of everything that he's achieved and oh that's amazing and and are you kind of I talk to people like when they've been through life challenges do you ever look back with any regret or anything not regret I think a recognition that it was hard um Mm -hmm. and not no but no regrets and I like I recognize the work that I started to do and trusting that it was at the right time and it's brought to where it's brought me to where I am now and therefore I cannot have any regrets because yeah our relationship is fantastic now it's it's taught me so much like the things about communication and various other things if we hadn't have been where we were I wouldn't have done research and read up all about all of that stuff and have the tools and techniques which have supported me um and our relationship so yeah no regrets at all I love that I love that because like I say everybody's got a big why to why they do things and you've definitely got a big why Mm. so Emma ask everybody this question tell me three good things about yourself three good things about myself I think I am a bloody good listener and it's weird today because I've done like all of the time talking which is really bizarre love it that's um, one so really, really good listener 
I think that I am an amazing, fun, like, auntie to my best friend's children, who I absolutely adore. And I think I, I don't think, three good things. I think I am a, yeah, a great friend as well. Like, yeah, a great friend. I love that. So if anybody's on friends that go like, I want to try and get in touch with them, where can they go on social media to find you? Um, give handles. I will put them in the links as well. But where can where's the go to to get in contact with you? It's Emma Wonder Emma Woodford underscore Life Coach on Instagram. And on Facebook, it's um, just Emma Woodford or Life Coaching with Emma Woodford. And there's emmawoodford.co.uk as well. That's amazing, mate. Well, thank you so much for being a fantastic guest. Yeah, um, I love me. the work you're doing because like, men's mental health is shockingly high. So I do think it's so important that ladies get to learn about how to be the best best version of themselves in a situation that's not great so carry on doing the fantastic work that you're doing I highly recommend Emma and I if you are sat on on the fence and you're feeling that frustration and that guilt and Emma will understand so please get in touch with her and have a chat with her because I think she's worth her weight in gold and you won't regret it. Yeah, so thank you, my lovely, for joining me. It's been an absolute honour. Um, yes, you, you, you've done all the talking. It's great. <laughs> and I shall speak to you soon.